The Innovators Network. This is Killer Innovations, a show about ideas, creativity, and how you can innovate. Welcome to the Innovators Garage, where you learn to create your next game-changing killer innovation. Welcome to Killer Innovations. I'm your host, Phil McKinney. We are here in the studio. In fact, I just got done doing a three-camera shoot here in our studio in Colorado for um, some of my prediction videos that I always do. Normally, I would do those for the Consumer Electronics Show. CES this year is virtual, uh, but we will still be putting out um, my annual predictions for, the, for that year. So this will be the 2021 predictions um, of... Uh, major disruptions, innovations, thoughts about changes. Now, I've been doing these videos for, uh, you know, man, over, probably over a decade and a half. So you can actually go back and uh, go over to hp.com and you can search for them on their YouTube channel. Uh, you can also search for them over at Cable Labs, where I'm the CEO today at. Um, so I've just kept up the the whole preparing the prediction videos and uh you may want to check those out and uh, see somebody actually did one time go all the way back through all of those youtube videos and tried to calculate out my accuracy and it's not too bad but you know it's um it's not really about how accurate the prediction is it's more about a, a thought or mental exercise um and also hopefully it spurs you to think maybe a little bit differently about the future look we're we're all rushing to get the heck out of 2020 it's been an unbelievably uh, crazy year um but we want you know I, I use these really as the kind of thought exercises for myself but also thought exercises for you so so today's topic for the show is a little bit of an extension of a, of a show I did a couple of weeks ago, and I did one where I talked about um, how did I build up my innovation self-confidence? So what did, what was my work experience like? What were the things that kind of laid the foundation that allowed me to have that confidence to think about really innovation as a career? not just a, a skill set, but really to to commit the last 25, 30 years of, of my life just being wholly all in on innovation and creativity. So I shared, and that was really laid as a foundation based on really some early jobs. My first, what I would call real first job was Anchor Industries in Evansville, Indiana, um, uh, owned by the Dawes family. Uh, uh, can't speak highly enough about them. Um, and also, if you're interested in big circus tents, canvas products, awnings, check them out, Anchor Industries. Uh, the second one was my second job, which was Deltac, um, which was a, basically technology training. I was hired in uh, by uh, Bob Davis, who is my first mentor. If you've been listening to the show for any length of time, uh, you've heard the whole Bob Davis uh, storyline. Bob Davis, Roxy Westfall, Peter Dignan, Bob King, uh, Ron Califf. You know, there's a whole cadre. Uh, uh, Mark Battaglia. There's a whole cadre of of people that I uh, met and who I still have stayed in contact with over all of these years. Um, but that's really where. Uh, I had my first management position. I was hired in. Then I was a manager, and I was having to, you know, put together job descriptions and hire people onto a team, um, and all of that. So that was those two jobs kind of laid the foundation. And if you want to understand why and how those leaders inspired me, because you could use those same techniques with your own staff, particularly staff that are younger. And how do you motivate? And how do you prepare them? for a career, not just that they will work for you. I think about every uh, person who's ever worked for me, not about how do I keep them to stay at the job. Yeah, you wanna do that because you've making an investment, but 
I tell you, I've gotten so much in return when I think about staff and investing in them in preparing them for wherever their career takes them. It may not be where we're at today. It may take them in a completely different direction, but the return, the contacts, I've got interns who have done and become absolutely amazing leaders in their own right. And the relationships and the ability to call them up and them calling me and just staying in the loop and helping each other out. It's, it, those things are invaluable. So invest in your teams, invest in your individuals, not about what you're going to get back from them in the current job, invest to help them in a long-term career. So today's topic is around entrepreneurship. So I've done you know, Anchor Industries. It was probably 200 employees when I was there. It's over 350 now from what I understand. Um, and Dell Tech was probably in the same, same realm. And I always thought those were those absolutely huge companies. Right, you know, most I've worked at is a bowling alley. Prior to that, I worked high school and college part time in the evenings at a bowling alley. Right, that's how I made money to pay for my college. Uh, there was no scholarship, and where I grew up, my family, my parents that didn't have the money to put me, pay me, pay for me to go to college. So I worked literally forty hours a week and carried a class load. So. How did I get, how did I learn about entrepreneurship? Well, how did I learn about entrepreneurship was really around, um, you know, going to a, uh, a, you know, and learning and understanding that there's a different set of skill sets about being an entrepreneur. It's about having an idea, being assertive. Um, you got to have a certain amount of skills. You got to have some knowledge. You have to provide some leadership and you have to have a strategy. How am I going to make this happen? What do I do first? What do I do second? And I quickly realized, albeit I was intrigued coming off of my Dell Tech experience of having been on a, on a management rotation where I tried all the different jobs inside of an organization. I really liked that. But uh, I knew that I wasn't ready to go right out and, you know, pluck down my own money and do that. And so what I did was, is I went to another company. I went to a company called Individual Software. Now, I actually, what happened was, is Bob Davis, who hired me, at Dell Tech, he went to individual software in Silicon Valley and then turned around and hired me. And that's how I ended up in Silicon Valley. Now, individual software, small company. At this time, less than 20 employees. It had been around for a couple of years. Joel Hendrickson was the founder. Joel's still there. He's the CEO, still at individual software. Um, but I came in... Um, so I didn't have to do the startup. I didn't have to go pitch the initial idea. I didn't have to go raise the money, but I learned how to work inside of a startup. And inside of a startup, you do everything. If it requires you go out and pick up lunch for everybody, sweep the floors. In my case, I was designing and building a products. They had the one, the big product that I worked on at Individual and did the, the design and the coding on was a product called Typing Instructor. You can still buy it. You can go to individual software. You can go to Best Buy. This product is still available. Not based on my same code, but the concept of the product, which we built, oh, I'm going to say back, this is 1984, um, is still the fundamental behind that product, and it's sold millions and millions of copies. But what I learned there was, is look, you know, we, we, were, we all sold. If you, you know, we're going to be at a, a weekend show in San Francisco or something down in the convention center in Silicon Valley, everybody was there. You were you were you were a salesman. Then you came back, you duplicated discs and you boxed them and you shipped them. Now you were the shipping department. Um, some customer called in with a problem. Now you were customer care. You literally recognize in a startup environment you are doing everything. So if you're an innovator. Don't get yourself in the habit of thinking, oh, I can just be the idea person. I can just sit back and do ideas. No, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you literally do everything. And in my, you know, and, and the kind of the philosophy I have is, is I always wanted to do everything. I want to have that entire experience. My, what I learned at Dell Tech, where I spent six months in sales and six months in marketing and six months in finance, and I had this rotation to learn every position inside of an organization. I love that. I love being involved and engaged in a number of different areas. And that's 
what really ignited me on the entrepreneurship. So an individual, what I learned was, was how to, you know, the, what, what that was it take to really keep a small operation going. But I didn't have to come up with the original idea. I didn't have to go raise the money. I did my job, but I kept my eyes open and I used it along a strategy to kind of flesh out the skills I knew I did not have. And individual software did a great job of preparing me for that part of it. Now, I also recognize that at a certain part with individual software, there was skills I needed to learn that I was not going to learn there. So I was there for a little while, and then I went off to uh, the next position. And again, part of this is having a plan, not just waiting for something to actually happen. Have a plan. So when we come back from this commercial break, I'm going to let you in on step two of my plan on how I learned to be an entrepreneur. Well, welcome back to Kill Innovations. Let's continue the conversation. This, what I'm sharing with you today on today's show is about how I learned to be an entrepreneur. Now, I did a whole bunch of startups before I got my first, what I would call, big win, which was being part of the founding part of a team, growing that business, taking it public through an IPO, having founder shares, cashing those shares out, and establishing a financial base on which I could build the rest of my career off of. But the key being is, is knowing all of the skill sets that you need to be a successful entrepreneur. And for me, I realized that I I was going to have to go to multiple jobs um, across the career to learn the different pieces. Now, as I talked about in the last segment, uh, what I learned at Individual Software was how to be part of a team, how to be part of a small operation, kind of watch the process, see how Joel uh, as the as the CEO, how he ran the business, how he thought about it. Now, Joel came from, he was formerly a, a senior executive at, at Varian, which was a, a big company in Silicon Valley. They developed the machines that go into semiconductor factories. And that's where Joel came from. He took his retirement and uh, started, he believed in the early 80s that training around this new, whizzy, kind of interesting new Technology called a PC would be a big market. Individual software was probably one of the first companies out there to build uh, computer-based training for the PC market segment. Um, And he's had a long run of it. Individual is still there. I think they're headquartered now in Livermore, maybe Pleasanton, but out in the East Bay of Silicon Valley. Um, In fact, I just looked them up um, just to make sure they were still around. They still are. Um, But I went there to learn how to be part of a team in a small uh, organization. And you recognize that you have to be, you have to literally do everything. You don't, there's no such thing as kind of sitting back and, uh, um, uh, you know, just having one job. Oh, I'm just software and I'm just customer care and I'm just sales. You do everything. So what was the skill that I didn't have though? And that was literally getting something up out of the dirt. Nothing. Not even on nothing scratched out on a piece of paper. How do you take it up out of the dirt? Now, the next position I took was with an organization called Corporate Resource Associates. And yes, if you're watching the video, you actually get to see the scanned image of my business card at CRA. Now, what was unique about CRA was is that CRA was started by two people I worked with at Deltac, Bob Davis my mentor, and Roxy Westfall. Now, interestingly enough, actually just this last January, I was in Phoenix, Arizona, and got to actually sit down and spend an hour, 90 minutes or so with Roxy, kind of catching up on everything uh, going on with her and sharing with her about our kids. And now that I have grandkids, right? And we both laughed about how old we are. Now, in the case of Corporate Resource Associates, again, it was a training company. So you kind of see a a trend here, Dell Tech, corporate training, big, big, uh, typically everything from training on mainframes to 
Uh, if you're familiar with James Martin on technology training, that was Dell Tech. Individual software, computer-based training for the PC, corporate resource associates, custom training. So this was all about building training programs for others, for specifically for their organization. Now, in reality, you know, we had a, we, you know, we had like a, a one and a, one, one and a half year old daughter, my oldest, who's now a mother herself. She was uh, an infant going into being toddler um, hood at this point. My wife and I, we, we both came from very, uh, very meager means from, from a family perspective. We had no money, you know, to invest to do a startup. So Bob and Roxy actually started Keep Corporate Resource Associates. I didn't participate in what I would call literally the the, the, the setting up of the entity or, or any of that. We had no money to contribute. But as soon as they got corporate resources you had set up, then they brought me in. So, and it was myself, and then there's Gary, and it was, it was a whole cadre of, of people that eventually became um, CRA. CRA's clients ranged from HP. This was my first what I would call engagement with HP, and that was developing the training for um, the very new first commercial introduction of what was called RISC uh, processors, reduced instruction set computing. HP launched the very first RISC processors called the HP uh, PA, a precision architecture, for an HP 3000, HP 9000 spectrum. Um, and uh, we developed all of that training to train the HP people about their product. So this was what we did, was take complex technical information and translate it to be used by salespeople, marketing people, customer support people, um, basically taking very, like I said, very, very technical information and making it easily consumable, which also taught me how to communicate. How do you take complex items in concepts and make them very simple so anybody could um, understand. We also did work for Rome. If you're familiar with Rome, they're the, they're the company that invented voicemail, eventually uh, to be acquired by IBM. Uh, we did uh, U.S. Navy. We did uh, Security Pacific Bank. If you're from California, that they got uh, acquired by uh, B of A. What I really learned at CRA was assertiveness, standing up. I was still a pretty young uh, person, you know, and people tend to, you know, think uh, you look at you, oh, you don't have enough gray hair, so therefore you must not know anything. So you got to be a little assertive if you're at the younger end of your category. And I also learned about strategy, right? Because as CRA was coming up, it started off in the spare bedroom at uh, Bob's house in Redwood Shores. And eventually, we ended over up on El Camino, which is this address. And then eventually, we had a whole floor over on Twin Dolphin Rot Drive over in Belmont. So we, the business grew pretty quick over the first couple of years. And what's that strategy? And how do you think about it? And going with Bob out on sales, for, sales calls. So for me, having worked for Bob at Dell Tech, working for Bob at Individual, and now working with both Bob and Roxy in taking the business, which basically was a piece of paper and actually building it and growing it and watching it really up close. So not being part of the, the initial start, but being right there at the table and seeing what it took from the founders to literally get it up, get it up functional. And then how do you think about resourcing and investment and costs and all those kinds of things? So there was, it was probably the best MBA I could have ever hoped for was having the privilege of sitting at that table and seeing what it took to get uh, CRA up out of the dirt. So, um, you know, so CRA, I was there for uh, quite some time. So at this point, I've done Anchor, I've done Dell Tech, I did individual software, and now I've done CRA. So what's the next step on my path to becoming an entrepreneur? We'll cover that right after this quick commercial break. Welcome back. Uh, today's show is a little bit different as I talked about at the very beginning. I'm actually doing this standing up, so you're probably seeing my body weaving around. 
Maybe you hear a little bit more energy. I'm trying this out as an experiment, but it really got uh, done out of practicality because I just have wrapped up a three camera shoot here in the studio um, in Colorado and didn't want to tear it all down and reconfigure it and put it back right away. So we're trying uh, this format. Um, we're only using one camera though for the for the show, given that I'm a I'm a one man operation here in the studio. So. Today, we're talking about how I learned to be an entrepreneur, and I did a bunch of startups over my years, both as just a early staff to being there at the table when, when the founders created the firm to starting my own firms up until I uh, had my, uh, what I would call my, uh, my first real big uh, win, my first big success. So as we talked about in the last uh, segment, talked about corporate resource associates, I wasn't what I would call the founder. That was Bob Davis and Roxy Westfall. Uh, what I was at, I was at the table. I was there watching them. You know, my wife and I were not of financial means to have any, you know, we, we were struggling to pay rent um, in Silicon Valley, much less to be able to contribute any kind of uh, cash. Uh, or, and we were still pretty young. And, you know, I, I had done, you know, really what I would call three, three jobs in my entire life. Um, so it wasn't like I was bringing a huge, you know, wealth of experience. I made up for it in energy, I guess. Uh, if you ask Bob or, or Roxy these days, you know, why they, uh, you know, why they uh, brought me along on this phenomenal ride. So at CRA, did a lot of work with technology companies like HP, did uh, Intel, uh, did some work for Apple. My one claim to fame is, is some of the my code actually uh, shipped with the 1984 Mac, um, Rome, um, et cetera. And this was a combination of uh, training and also actual uh, development work. I uncovered that I had a pretty good skill set at, 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 at being able to hide complexity, being able to take something that's complex and make it very simple. And the software that I built was also about you know, putting uh, a face onto technology that at that time um, was was pretty intimidating. A lot of people were not comfortable with even keyboard skills, much less anything else. Um, and so what was going on was, is uh, particularly with the work at HP, it was new technology. It wasn't even out or Apple. It wasn't, the, the, they hadn't even announced it. I had a prototype Mac on a dining room table in this little one-bedroom apartment in Belmont with a toddler crawling around on the floor, at, you know, and it's staying up all night trying to get this thing done to make sure to make the ship date for the for the Macintosh. Um, and so, you know, my skill set, I quickly really liked working in taking concepts and ideas, products and technologies, and turning them into what I would call really commercially successful products. So go from spark to idea to innovation and that's where you know my entrepreneur bug and with regards to this really got uh, really got uh, taken off so so what did i do what did i do that um kind of got this whole thing started and that was i went off and started my own company called millennium rand why rand rand standing for research and development so millennium rand uh in sunnyvale and Millennium Rand's mission was really to help innovators who had maybe that idea and who needed help in turning it into a commercial offering to make it real. You know, that's what I did at Dell Tech. They had an idea, didn't have a way to make it. I actually built the entire product myself. Individual software. Had an, they had the idea about typing instructor, had no way of understanding all the technical complexities and how to make it work. That's what I did. CRA, same thing. Millennium ran. I wanted to focus on that as my, uh, is what would, would really uh, got me excited. And so that was basically going in with clients who maybe had a raw idea about something new, a new market, a thing, et cetera, et cetera, but they didn't have the people or the, the skill sets or the confidence that it could someone could take literally something off the back of a napkin and, and deliver a finished and completed product. And that's where my reputation had gotten built was being able to 
you know, pull four all-nighters back to back and do everything from debugging hardware bores to, to writing embedded apps, uh, burning ROMs, writing user interfaces, um, et cetera, do the whole, you know, the whole thing. And that's what, what we did at Millennium Ran. Had a couple of subcontractors and eventually ended up with a couple of employees. And we did work for uh, companies like Ashton Tate. If you're familiar, if you've been around long enough, uh, Ashton Tate was the, uh, in, had a software product called DBase. It was basically a database uh, software. So think of what you know, you may see now today on Postgres or Ingress on, on cloud services, that's what Ashton Tate was on, on the PC. And Ashton Tate had some ideas for new products, again, taking it from literally scratched out over lunch, you know, a couple of block diagrams on the back of a napkin, and then turn around and come back and deliver um, a finished product. Uh, Mountain Hardware, um, we did, I did a project for them on uh, what was called uh, disk duplication. And uh, this was the very first volume, you know, duplicator. You put in a whole big stack of five and a quarter or three and a half inch floppies. Yes, I know I'm aging myself. And put your master in, hit a button, go away, come back, and it automatically duplicated them. So that included mechanical hardware and hard, you know, and and uh, media platforms and software. In fact, um, we launched that product at Comdex Show, and uh, I remember in, being in the uh, in the back of a you know you today you would call it you know a, a, a small little van RV van, and we're literally debugging the hardware and finishing the software as we drove from San Francisco to Las Vegas to launch the product. Big, but it was a big success. In fact, um, it came out quite well. One of my clients for Millennium Rand was a company called Thumbscan, fingerprint biometric devices. Again, this is a very rough, raw concept uh, from uh, uh, two individuals out of the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. They had this idea. They thought, oh, wouldn't this be cool? Could we do this? And they drew it out, but they couldn't, get, they couldn't build a prototype. They couldn't actually prove it. They had a hypothesis, but they couldn't prove it. And they had secured some venture funding from Frontenac Venture Capital out of Chicago. So I was brought in to basically talk to the two people who had the original idea and then take that back and actually turn around and bring back a fully functional prototype. Now, the problem was is the original concept that the two founders came up with would not work. The, the hypothesis was fundamentally false. However, if you take out the technology hypothesis and look, think about the market, the market was valid, but we had to come up with an entirely new approach to deliver that, and we did. And the product actually was quite successful. Uh, certain three-letter government agencies love this product. Fingerprint security for under $1,000 a unit. And this was back in 19, you know, 86, 87 is when we built this. Um, now, what really happened was is the front end venture capital then came to me, right, because I ended up taking the, the raw concept and built the product to say, you know something, we want you. We want you to come and be part of the management team. We'll give you shares, et cetera. We need you. And they made me an offer I just absolutely could not refuse. So I actually sold Millennium Rand to the employees. Um, it's now referred to as Millennium Partners. Uh, but I sold that to the employees to dedicate myself to Thumbscan. And in the process, actually found a company in Silicon Valley that had a security product, talked Thumbscan into acquiring it called Gordian Systems. Uh, I took the Gordian Systems and I built an entirely second product for Thumbscan called PC Boot. And PC Boot went on to win Product of the Year that next year. So I won two Product of the Year awards two years in a row um, at Comdex. One for Mountain Hardware and the other one for Thumbscan for PC Boot. And that is revenue from PC Boot allowed Thumbscan to actually complete its biometric product. So for me, that's what really gets me excited. I may not be have all the technical expertise to do the original ideas, but helping people go from ideas to delivering 
the commercial product. And this is what I learned. But there's one more step on my path to learning how to be an entrepreneur. And we're going to cover that when we come back from this break. Welcome back to the show. Today, we're going to wrap up the topic we're talking about, which was sharing with you the steps I took to learn how to be an entrepreneur. Uh, my first couple of jobs, you know, kind of got me hooked on the whole bug of not just being a software engineer, but uh, being what I call a T-shaped individual. An I-shaped individual is someone who's very deep in one area. In my case, software engineering. Um, and in particular, um, uh, a lot of expertise in uh, embedded systems and complex technologies, new processors, new technologies, kind of at that at the at the leading edge on those areas. That's where my eye shape would would have been if I just stayed in software engineering. However, I knew that I just got bitten by the bug that it wasn't just the technology piece, but also understanding um, all of the other areas. And as I talked before, just Prior to this, you know, I had done everything from um, going to a startup, being being at the table watching a startup get launched, to starting my own business, to then joining a, a, a an entity that's being funded out of venture capital. So I had some experience dealing with venture capital and you know raising B rounds and C rounds, etc. And then eventually Thumbscan got sold off to Cominvest AB out of Stockholm, Sweden, and I was kind of uh, between gigs. Well, the original founders of Thumbscan, so these are the individuals at the University of Illinois, where I took the, the concept off of the back of a napkin and uh, turned it into a real product that allowed them to raise money and you know, be quite successful. They recruited me. They had another idea. Uh, coming out of the university, and this was around supercomputers. Um, and so I was recruited following the sale from Thumbscan um, to move to Champaign, Illinois, at home of the University of Illinois, um, to become the president of Teraplex. Now, Teraplex uh, was a supercomputer company that was based on a, a radically new processing architecture called MISC, or Minimal Instruction Set Computers. You can go to Google, search for MISC, you can see it. Uh, you can actually still find some articles about uh, the work we did there. Uh, Teraplex was funded initially by the, by the state of Illinois and a couple of um, high net worth angel investors. I came in as the president, uh, solidified some additional funding. So that was my experience of learning to deal with angel investors. Keep in mind, it was I've, I've, my experience now covers everything from self-funding out of people's pockets to you fund based on winning consulting deals. So you basically are replowing dollars in to venture funding to now angel funding. So Terraplex was where I learned how to raise angel uh, funding and subsequent rounds of angel funding, doing things like convertible debt and all kinds of, you know, uh, uh, capital structures in order to uh, fund Terraplex. And uh, Terraplex, I think, was, was quite successful. We actually, uh, I also went off and um, uh, secured uh, technology licensing agreements. Uh, one a uh, big one that we had was with Atmel uh, out of Silicon Valley. They took a, a license to the architecture for the MISC processor. Uh, we have we signed a deal, made made a little bit of noise back in the day. Business Week wrote a big article about it. So that's also where I learned about there's multiple paths to commercialization. It doesn't always have to be um, in that uh, in that traditional sense. So if I look at all the things I had to learn about leadership and uh, uh, tenacity and knowledge, where I learned, you know, self-funding to uh, profit funding to venture funding to angel funding to uh, 
uh, commercialization paths of building the product, partnering for the product, licensing to the product. That's all the skill sets I had to have in order to be successful um, as, uh, as, a, as an entrepreneur. And so, you know, what I really found through this whole thing was my skill set. My skill set being idea to innovation. That translation of an idea, whether it's mine or somebody else's, but taking an idea, an idea without execution has no value. It's a hobby. And I'm not in the hobby business. My entire career has been taking ideas, whether they're mine or somebody else's, and turning those into innovations. And that's what really gets me uh, excited, ideas to innovations. And so hopefully you found this interesting, gives you a little background and context. You know, you're probably sitting there going, okay, this is great, Phil. You've given us a little bit of a roadmap of your career. What does this mean for me? How do I apply this? What I would actually encourage you to do is think about um, attending a disruptive ideation workshop, bring it into your organization. Uh, but this is teaching this ideas to innovation. How do you take an idea and turn it into an award-winning, game-changing, totally transform, whether it be you, maybe you've got a raw idea and you want to make, you want to, you know, turn that into a real product. You're part of a team or you're part of an organization and you want, you, you're looking to create innovations that are disruptive. That's what this workshop is all about. And so uh, you can hop on over to disruptiveideation.com, disruptiveideation.com. You can find out more information. Sometimes I teach those courses, but it's my workshop and I've trained trainers. They teach that workshop. Um, but feel free, we can, you know, if you want, we can get on the phone, we can chit chat about it, whatever uh, makes sense. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, uh, drop me an email. You can do that over at phil at killerinnovations.com. Also read the blog over at philmckinney.com. Um, I do periodic just writings about leadership and um, innovation ethics and a variety of different topics. Um, but you can also find the show notes for today's show and the entire back catalog going back almost 16 years now over at killerinnovations.com. If you want to get connected, um, I put out a weekly email which kind of summarizes uh, the leading thinking uh, of the week around innovation. So text the word innovation to 44222, or you can send an email to innovation at killerinnovations.com. And with that, we're going to wrap up uh, today's show. We're coming up on the end of the calendar year. We've got some exciting announcements for the first shows in, in January, so you're not going to want to miss that. So subscribe. And with that, have a great week. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. This show is distributed by the Innovators Network. For more information and other great shows and content, visit theinnovators.network.